I noticed a few on Twitter. Welcome back, ladies and Jews, to Kevin Pollock's chat show. I am, as always, chat show. How are you, and a happy new year. Yes, I understand. We're coming to you live on the 17th of January, but I've not been at this table since uh, the middle part of December. It's been a month since I've stared down your barrel. Wait for it. Oh, that's good barrel. Uh, we come to you, as always, these days from the uh, West Side Comedy Theater on the auspices of Sean Casey and Friends. I want to thank them. If you ever want to see a great sketch or stand-up show in the West Side of Los Angeles area, check out West Side Comedy. Dana Carvey, for example, just going to drop in on maybe a 90-seat room here tonight. It's sold out. Don't get excited. It's 90 seats. It wasn't that hard. Um, but yeah, check their calendar. Go to westsidecomedytheatersomething.com. Is it a thing? West Side Theater? Whatever it I is. I think it's look. just West Side. It might just be West Side Comedy. Hey, use Google. Leave us alone. I'll look it up. Please. Uh, recent guests, you ask? All right. Settle down. The unfairly talented Don Cheadle and the creator of the television program Breaking Bad, a connection to our guest today, just saying. Mr. Vince Gilligan, a uh, recent guest. Check those out in our library on iTunes, Earwolf, or the YouTube where we're streaming right now live. Do you join us on a Sunday on occasion? I understand there's a big football thing happening right now. North Carolina is doing their best to put away Seattle. Uh, I wish them good luck with that, by the way. I don't know why I despise Seattle. Well, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> But the football team, by the way, town, crazy for it. It's a sister city to my own uh, birthplace in San Francisco. I do love the town of Seattle. The football team? Yeah. Uh, sitting in for Sam Levine today is uh, Corey Levin, I'm told. Apparently. And uh, uh, we'll go to Jamie Foxx first. Jamie, updates? Uh, Westsidecomedy.com is the website. Westsidecomedy? Yes. Dot com. And mm -hmm. upcoming shows on the website? Nope. They have shows seven nights a week. True, and week. there are upcoming shows. There are upcoming shows. They have shows seven nights a week, and their house show, which would be uh, Mission Improbable, is at 10 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays, and it's a lot of short-form improv games that are, it's a super fun show. So if you're ever in the area on a Friday, Saturday night, and want to come here at 10 p.m., uh, you'll have a good time. Yeah, you'll there. have a great How's that? time. How's that for a sell? That was pretty on good. On the spot. It was pretty good, <laughs> and with the level of enthusiasm we were hoping for on there take one, I don't feel we need a, t a second take. I'm gonna that do. Was off the cuff. I'm gonna go with the Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Literally, a finger snapping off the cuff. Yeah. Um, what else can we tell you? Write to us, won't you? I have some emails apparently that were printed out for me. Are they on the printer? Oh. Oh. Yeah, probably. Oh. All right. Well, at some point, we'll ask Corey to get up and see if he can find them. I think Kenny's on it. Kenny's on it. Kenny's. <laughs> Write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. I'm going to read some of your Larry King submissions. If you want a t-shirt, I'm just saying, and you live in the United States, sorry, those of you living around the, the world, outside of this country, but it's like $75 to send a fucking t-shirt to, to you wonderful people. Even Canada? And I made the mistake of saying, we'll take care of the shipping a long, long time ago. And uh, literally $17 to ship something to Australia. What about Canada? Canada's only $7. <laughs> Canada, Canada, they pay us. Yeah, no. I'm, of course, kidding. Right, <laughs> right here, Larry story. King. And from all over the world, we'd love to read them and send you a T-shirt no matter where you live. We're coming to you live on the YouTube. Subscribe to us, won't you? Write a review if it kills you. Do you listen to us on Earwolf? Just let us know how you uh, consume the show so that we can share that with the fine folks around the world. Uh, before we get to our guest, um, was just up at the Sketch Fest last week, which is why we weren't here. Sam Levine sat in as your guest host with Sam McMurray. I was a little bummed. I missed that one. I yeah. Love, I love a great character actor, which is why I'm excited about our guest today. Yes. I'm a um, fan. Uh, we, we, the Sam McMurray and I did L.A. Story together, in which Steve Martin, that was a rap gift, Gave some, the same thing to me, Sam McMurray, and Larry Miller. And it's a thank you note that I have stolen anytime I'm giving the same gift of more than one person. So the thank you note said, dear, and then all three of our names, two of which were crossed out. You were my favorite, don't tell the others. Mm -hmm. Steve Martin. So I still signed Steve Martin, which seems I, 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 should, <laughs> I should fix that part. 
Get a lot um, of credit I just did that on the new television program that I'm allegedly on called Angel from Hell. Hey, did I mention I'm on? Hmm? Uh, Thursday nights, check it out. Let us know what you think of the Angel from Hell on the CBS uh, broadcast. That's all, I, that's all the time I can stall for the opening of the show. I'm not sure which one of these questions I want to ask first. Yes, I think I just nailed it. Okay. I'm going to introduce our guest today with that question. Uh, you can tweet live uh, questions for our guests right now at, uh, at KP Chat Show. Is that what you're checking or my name? At Kevin Pollock or at KP yeah. Chat Show? Huh? <laughs> Neither. What's the story? I don't know how to get into my Twitter anymore. I quit Twitter. Oh, Jesus. Corey, would you mind? It'd be my pleasure. Fantastic. <laughs> so where'd you get those questions? Oh, the Facebook. Um, so here's my first question for our guest today. Uh, this is my way of introducing him. I've forever joked about the moment in time when the actor William Conrad, his agent had to call him with the offer for a television pilot called Jake and the Fat Man, wherein Conrad asks, is the character Jake something I'll be able to sink my teeth into? <laughs> <laughs> and his agent has to answer, you're not Jake. Please welcome one of the guest stars of that very program, Mr. Jerry Burns. Jerry, do you remember appearing on that show? It's been 107 years. Yeah, I was listening to you. I was listening to that funny anecdote, and I was thinking, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. And just before you got to me, I thought, wait a minute, I was on that show. Yeah, you were. So what are your memories? I have no <laughs> memories of being on that show. I'm trying to think. What are you, 17 when this happens? This no, is a long it's, time ago. It's 30 years ago. Um, yeah. Easy. You know, when you, when you used to do, when one used to do, if you were in my position, you used to do whatever guest stars came your way. And when no you, question. Yeah, and when you got here from New York, as I did. I think it's more than 30 years, by the way. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, not that many more. I probably got here when I was 27. Okay. So 35, yeah, 33 years ago. Um, and you would just, because you were from New York, they, they kind of were a little excited that you could maybe play different characters. And so they, I would get opportunities to go on all this, what was, what I will kindly refer to as disposable television, right? Sure. Do you remember the Quinn Martin genre? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that Jake and the Fat Man was, but who was the guy? Who was the other guy? Who was Jake? Do you remember? Oh, man. Tweet that in. Uh, Who was Jake? He had a career. He was like a handsome guy. It was a Joe Perry? Yes. What a pull. Did I pull that? You did. Did I just fucking you pull that? You did fucking pull Okay, so it was Joe Perry. I can't remember what I did. Who was the handsome guy. Who also might have been with guy. you on the episode of The Love Boat. There's no telling. I've never done The Love Boat. Oh, okay. Fantasy Island. I did the remake version of Fantasy Island. And who starred in that? Um, uh, McDowell. Not Roddy McDowell, but Malcolm McDowell. And the little guy was, was the star of by. that. I, they didn't have a little guy. They had a big, fat Italian guy. <laughs> they couldn't replace Hervé Villa. Who by then? Why Joe, even try? By then, Joe Perry was the big, fat Italian guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So how about that phone call to J to to William Conrad's hilarious. agent? That's hilarious. That's hilarious. And I barely remember. I barely remember Robert Conrad. I remember things like. I had no idea when I got here from the New York stage how to do television. No so, training. No, no, well, no, no. I mean, just had training for the stage. So I'd get up like this, you know, and the camera guys would be, whoa! <laughs> they, I didn't know you had to kind of lean forward and stand up so they could hold you. And um, yeah, I didn't even know they added sound effects for punches. You know, and I was so used to fighting with as a kid and making, you know, <laughs> that uh, you made that in sound? my second episode of the Hill Street Blues arc that I did, I had a fight with Michael Warren and, um, you know, they yelled cut and the sound guy was like, I think the kid is making punching noises with his mouth. Can you ask him? <laughs> and the director, you know, didn't really know how to kindly say, but he did. Are you making punching noises? <laughs> or getting hit noises. When you shot the gun, did you in fact? No, I, didn't, I never did that. I never did that, but I did have an experience I remember of, you probably had this where you have to, 
you have an addition where you have to hold people at gunpoint. Sure. You've had those, sure. right? You, and I was so tired of using this as the gun because you've got to you got to improv the gun to some degree. Did you would you do this in the in the in the auditions? Probably. You know, like probably. I think I would always do that. And I, one day I said, "Fuck it, I'm going to bring in a squirt gun." I mean, I, at least I didn't bring in a gun, but I brought in a squirt gun and it was just so uncomfortable, you know, and midway, midway through the audition, I was just like... A little water you, dripping out the end. Yeah. You know, I'm going to stop because it feels weird with the, feels weird with the squirt gun, right? <laughs> Does it? And the director who couldn't, you know, could have given me a little slack said, yeah, it's sort of like, stop or I'll squirt. <laughs> said that. Yeah. <laughs> But it stayed with you all these years. Oh, I never forget. You never no. forget the slights. <laughs> you know? I have our Irish Alzheimer's. I forget everything but the grudges. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's a good one to remember. Yeah. Irish Alzheimer's. Uh, yeah. Here's another one for you. Mm. After studying at Amherst. And UMass ten- Amherst. UMass Amherst. Amherst. Yep. Let's not make a... Yeah, uh, let's not puff me up. Uh, and the Tisch School of the Arts. School of We've the Arts. We've had several people here... Uh, guests from the Tisch School of the Arts, as well as performing in the revered New York Shakespeare Festival. Tell me about your experience working on a little something we call (laughs) Moms on Strike. (laughs) Uh, You guys do do your research. Moms on Strike, I think, might have been my first uh, foray into getting a SAG card. I think it was an after-school special in New York. And do you know who I think was in it as well? I do. You do? He, you spoke of him before we started, Sam McMurray. Boom. You knew that? No. Oh, okay. That's yeah, fantastic. I think, I think that's where I met Sam McMurray for the first time. That's crazy. No, I've spoken to it. I haven't spoken to Sam in years, but I think we're friends on Facebook. But uh, yeah, Sam was in, I can't remember what we did or who we were. I think we were probably the husband's of the moms who went on strike. You remember after school specials? They were a thing. They were a thing. They were an absolute thing. They were a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we're friends on Facebook. Let's go back to that. Uh, I know. It's like being a grand... You you really are a grandfather if you're on Facebook, right? (laughs) You're really old if you're on Facebook, right? (laughs) Well, as soon as... I just got on the Twitter. Yeah. As soon as parents got on Facebook, they pretty much ruined it for the kids. (laughs) Yeah. And the kids said, fuck this, and went elsewhere. Right. They're on Instagram. They're on Snapchat. Yes. Right. Are we okay up there in the crow's nest? Yes. Okay, good. Let me know when, Ka- when the game's over and Carolina has won. Okay. I guess it won't be for a while. We won't even be here. Never mind. Um, I'm on tape delay, so can you not let him know? Oh, uh, seriously? Yeah. Oh, yeah, don't let me know anything. Yeah, I'd no. love it if there weren't updates. A- and who are you rooting for in that? Carolina. Okay, good. Yeah. We can continue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, they were after-school specials, and they were a thing. I mean, you uh, ever do one? I don't think so. My first oh, you'd remember foray. Well, yeah, you would. My first foray was um, thirty something. I think my SAG card came from an episode nice. of Thirty Something. Nice. It was around the same time as Who's the Boss? Okay. Amen. Right. A show called Amen. You did that. I did, you, you did an amen. episode of Everything amen. you said so far, by the way, has a punctuation mark at the end. Ed Dot Weinberger. Ed Dot. Ed, Ed Dot. You remember Ed Dot? Yes. Ed Dot created Dear John. Yes, he did. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And he came from the taxi world or the cheers? A taxi. Ed a Taxi. Weinberger. Yeah. Yeah. The great Ed Weinberger. The great Ed Weinberger. I had such crazy nerve back then. I remember, I'm just a guest star. On Amen. Why is that hard to? And I pitch believe. Ed Weinberger a show idea. Oh. I, no experience doing anything. What were you playing, the delivery guy, and you're <laughs> pitching him? Yeah. A, a network show. Uh huh. How'd he, it go? He said, "Come to the office." Really? Yeah. And? I, well, this is before I pitch. I said, "I have an idea. I'd love to pitch." You can come to the office. Oh, he came. Okay. So I go to the office. I pitch him the idea, and he takes the time to let me know that I'm barely in show business. Really? Yeah. In a nice way? Yeah. Is there, yeah. In a nice way, not in a dismissive way. What did he do? He said, here's why your idea is horrible and you should, and you should utilize opportunities opportunities like this a little better in the future. Really? Yeah. But again, in In a a nice way. Constructive. Wow. Yeah. In hindsight, do you think you agree? 
A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I often think of the nervy things I did, and if someone did them to me, I would not have had the patience. How's that going for you and your looking back? Me? Was there some nervy things that happened along the way? I remember on a show um, that I was a, re a recurring character on. It was a show, this is going back, um, with um, Sipowitz. It was a spinoff. Remember um, the, the Detective Sipowitz? NYPD Blue. Well, there was a spinoff from... Sipowitz. Was, was there, Sipowitz. Was a, there was a spinoff that... Oh, that okay. actor. Sorry, I had. Well, uh, no, no, no. It was a spinoff that that actor did. Dennis Franz. Dennis Franz, and um, I was a recurring character on that. This, to, to your point, I was a recurring character on that, and I had an idea for a story arc, or, or I had an idea for a beat. I don't even think it was a story. I think it was just like, and um, I mentioned it to the writers, right? And I quickly became. Um, no longer a recurring character on that show. I was never asked back again after. Come on. Swear to God. You connect those dots? I totally do. There was no reason to get rid of this character, and then <laughs> all of a sudden I was gone. If and I remember, I remember, like, what, after I suggested what I suggested, just a, just a cold. Oh. And I, I didn't go to anyone's office. The, the writers had just stepped aside, you know, and they were powwowing with, um, I think, some of the other actors. And, yeah, and I was... That was the last time I ever worked on that show. Beverly Hills Bunts. There you go. There you go. I have a funny story about Dennis Franz. Please share. What? Well, you know how my, well, my eldest sister, Jill, loved to tor uh, torment, mostly me, but sometimes Jacqueline a little bit too. This is my, my middle sister. And the, one of the things that she did to torment Jacqueline was she used to pretend that Jacqueline had a crush on Dennis Franz, and she <laughs> would do it by like, ripping out photos of them from like TV Guide, Google <laughs> Magazine, whatever, and like putting them like in her diary or like in her nightstand. And she would, and then she would, Jill would come to me and be like, Jacqueline's got this weird crush on Dennis Franz. Like, I'm serious, I'm serious. Like, go check her nightstand. And then like, I'd open her <laughs> nightstand and there'd be like a picture of Dennis Franz, like a heart around it. And Jill, <laughs> but Jill totally planted it. Like Jacqueline did, like, was not interested at all. It was funny. That's very it was actually cute. kind of a funny. That's very right? cute. She <laughs> should have used, turned that into a profession. It's that's elaborate. Sort of, but yeah. That's diabolical. Yes. Like Time Jill's, consuming. Yeah, Jill's evil. Yeah. By the way, exact same thing happened to me. <laughs> with Dennis Franz? Yeah, my brother just had it's everyone It's a little going. more believable with you, though. Thank right? you. Right? That it could be, really be real. You never know. You never it, know. It's a big world. <laughs> I pitched, uh, I was six lead on the, on the first sitcom yes, regular gig what was that? that I booked. What was that? A very short lived with a great cast. It was called Coming of Age. Barry Kemp, who did Coach. Sure. It was uh, Paul Dooley. Great. It was the great Paul Dooley. Alan Young, who was not the horse on Mr. Ed, but the star of Mr. Ed. Wow. Alan Young. Wow. Phyllis Newman. Right. From the New York Theater, of course. Of course. And Glynis Johns. Of course. Great British actress. Wow. The four of them in a retirement community, and I played the little corporate shithead who ran the place, who hated old people. I think that was fifth lead. So I pitched Jer Barry Kemp an idea. Of, did Barry create the show? He did. I pitched him an idea. No, actually, Doc Severson's wife, that's not, should, wow. that should not be her name. We are old. Emily. Doc Severson's wife. It was not Severson. It was not Emily Severson. Emily created the show, brought to Barry Kemp, he grandfathered it, and then they ran it together. So I pitched Barry an idea for the show. What if my character, because Paul Dooley and I are at each other's throats on the, every episode, what if their daughter shows up, a character that hadn't been introduced yet? What if their daughter shows up and she falls for me? That would make him crazy, right? And Barry said, that's a great idea. Do you want to write it? it had never crossed my mind that that was even an option or that would come up. So that was the old... Write it as an episode. Yeah. Okay. So that's when the director says to the actor, well, you have to horseback ride. And the actor says... Sure. I got a saddle in my trunk. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that old <laughs> adage. So he says, do you want to ride it? And I said, of course I do. What do you mean? I think never thought about that. And then I went off and wrote this thing, and not realizing that he was going to take whatever I wrote and then rewrite it because the sitcom, of course, written by committee and... But I got the on-screen written by credit and joined the Writers Guild. 
So there is one of those. And to what degree did it change? Page page one? The story, page one, absolutely. Two jokes remained. The story stayed the same, that she comes to town and falls for me and he, it drives him crazy, which was just a premise. And you guys shot it. And we shot it. Who was the girl? Uh, Do you remember? Now you're killing me. Yeah, because we're talking 1985. Because I want to say, I want to ask you this. I want to say, was that before or after Paul Dooley shot Popeye? Got to be way after. Not way. Oh, no, before. You're right. It's, uh, right it's about before. the same time. 85. Because I remember Paul Dooley and Popeye. And Playing it, uh, Wimpy. I'll I gladly so. pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Exactly, exactly. I have a funny um, anecdote about writers and Please? Owner, ownership of um, and, and names on scripts. I have uh, two writer friends who ran shows for a long time, and they were interviewing um, writers. And they were getting, or, or, or reading writers to cast up a show. And they read a script from a woman that they had worked for, worked with, who had they, had, they had had on staff like five years earlier on something. I can't remember what. They sh she submitted a, a, a script written by her. They read it. And they went, wait a minute. Didn't we fucking write this? And they realized. Oh, my God. They had done a page one rewrite when they had her on staff of a script that she had submitted, but her name was on the title, but they had- She gave them the rewrite. Not realizing that her agent is sending out scripts of rewrites that, oh yeah. My. And they, <laughs> they're like, wait a minute, we wrote this. And it's her writing sample. But it, it's, her, it's one of her writing samples, but you know, you don't know what your agent's sending out. No. And they sent out the wrong writing sample to the wrong people. The password is yikes. Yeah. Um, you know what, enough about those people. Let's get back to you. Yes. Yes. Uh, before we get to the absolute insane sort of five-year run of some of my favorite shows, I do like to go down memory lane a little yes. bit more. Um, Boston Legal, any stories of your time with Shatner or Spader, two of the great nut bars Tools. in the history of acting? I do not mind saying it. Tools. Tools. <laughs> Fucking tools. First of all, unpleasant people. Yes. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this on a podcast on YouTube, but that well, guy. Well, it's going to be all over the universe. Oh my God. This is going to be. This is our cl our clip for the I, viral I've video. I never. I have never. I I had a a scene. <laughs> I was the pr prosecuting attorney. Let's hope again. Yeah, in a case where that's Spader. Spotter or Spader? How do you say it? Yeah, I think it, it depends on how you feel about it. Yeah. I'll, in which Spotter was the, um, by the way, fantastic actor. They're both capable of brilliance. Fantastic actor. Yeah. Um, and he was such a fucking douche. <laughs> okay. I want to get into. Oh my God. <coughs> I want to get into specifics. Spader uh, came in, re reinvented himself maybe for the fourth time in Boston Legal. Specifically, when he got to do the final closing argument, because David Kelly would write these great closing arguments. They were so, amazing. So that the prosecuting attorney could crush it in such a way, and I want to talk to you about the, how that monologue was for you. Yeah. In such a way that as the viewer, even though it happened every week, you still fell for it and said, well, there's no way they're going to win. Spader's going to pull this out. Right. That's the greatest argument I've ever heard for why this person's going away. Right. And then Spader would step up. Yeah. And take these Shatner-like pauses. Yeah. That were, I have to admit, <coughs> as, as, as like unpleasant as he was to me, I still enjoyed watching him. Yeah. And he, I've never had that. I've never in my life had an adversarial relationship with a guy who I didn't know. Maybe you stole a job from him early on. No. His career had eclipsed mine. There's no telling at that though. point, and um, yeah, I just did. It was it was absolutely wild, and I don't, I can't remember all the specifics of it, but I do remember saying something like, um, at some point, it would. I remember there were a lot of things like I would do something, I would sit down after a take, and then he'd bounce up and he'd go over to the director, and they'd be having a conference about whatever it was I just did. And I remember one of the things was that I stood in front of the witness and apparently blocked 
I don't know whether I was blocking his view of the witness or what I was doing. I was, I was closer than he wanted me to be to the witness. May have been my witness, I don't even remember. And cut, he bounced up, flew over to the director, blah, 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 blah. And you know, they're having these confabs that are not including me, although clearly they're talking about me. And I remember just standing up and going, is there a problem? Is this a, is this a conversation maybe that I should be involved in? Because, and I, re I just remember getting, giving it back to him, getting in his face, not getting in his face, but making you it- You can only take so much of that. Making it clear, yeah. And getting a letter from the director who was also the executive producer, weeks later, thanking me for, so much for, for saying what so many people had wanted to say. Oh, wow. For so oh. long. <laughs> yeah. Just an unpleasant well, those, guy. But- yeah really fun to watch. And sure. That's what, that's what matters. That's what matters. That's why... Or just didn't like me. But that's why... Like well, me. but if the director wrote you that apparently he didn't like just about every guest star who came in and, and ran with him and the Bulls, you know? Because if you're, if you're just hitting a double in the gap, he doesn't give a shit. If you're going to swing for the fences, now you're in his territory. That's what I was doing. Yeah. You know, and you know, I mean, you see your speech... Right. And then you know what he's going to say after your speech. So no matter how good your speech is, his speech is going to be, and it's David Kelly, so what I got to say was good. It was fucking amazing. It was great. Real fun. But he's going to have a lot more, and it's going to be that much more. It's going to be diabolically brilliant. Right. And spade, spade, it's spade or spot. <laughs> Delivers. Can deliver. And he yeah. does. But it's that sort of personality that becomes the eggshell. Everyone's on eggshells. Uh, environment. Oh, yeah. Oh, and look at what we get to do. I know. That's what I don't get. You know, I don't get those people who look at what we get to do. We get to go and play people. We get to go play. Yeah. And call it a profession. Uh, yeah, I call it a job. And get a house and a car at some point. And insurance. Insurance. Um, can I ask who you were really kidding with the comparative literature college major? It's so funny. I, I remember thinking English didn't sound fancy enough. As a major? So it's some, which I was. And, uh, and, I, and so for, at some point, I don't know if I slipped and said comparative literature or I wanted to embellish sounding. Did you invent the term? No, there was such a term. Yeah. But then... I, I can't, someone miswrote it or I misspoke or I embellished and then I didn't really think about what comparative literature literally meant and mm. then I was asked by someone oh what did you what were the comparative literatures that you made that you that you studied because it means two genre, it means two different genres that's what that would mean sure you studied you know uh you, you, you studied Samuel Clemens and you and, studied blah blah yeah and I was stymied and then I realized oh that should I have, should never have said that <laughs> I should just say English. stick to English now and it says the, in the in the dossier that um, <clears throat> by the way I've received three emails we're coming up on seven years in March that's amazing I've received three emails in seven years that say stop saying dossier um, and it sticks out in my head. Will you? Three out of seven years. Well, I just... Said it again. Uh-huh. Um, that, uh, that your studies of theater and interest in being an actor came mm. quite late. Damn near graduation from the university. Is that possible? Well, I, you know, I... No, in, in high school, I went to this uh, private school in Cambridge where we had like this great little... It was a great you know, independent school, and uh, we learned a lot of stuff real early. I mean, I didn't even, I, I learned much more in high school than I did in college, and uh, and, and I was exposed to the theater, and in, 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 as a kid, my parents drug me to the theater, and uh, and then when I got to high school, they, we had this little, this great little drama program, and I was, uh, you know, we were doing Chekhov, and, uh, really? and Pinter, and all that stuff, 10th, 11th, and 12th grades, yeah, we were doing all that stuff. And, um, and I loved it, and it was great. I loved the attention, I loved the response, I loved the girls, I loved the whole thing, but I had been an athlete too, so that's where the, you know, there was a little conflict there, and then, uh, and then I think my senior year I stopped, 
pretty much stopped doing sports other than soccer maybe and, and I used to play like three sports and then I just played uh, and then I just did theater my senior year I went to UMass studied English took two years off then went to UMass studied English because I was like well what am I going to study drama what kind of a there's no there's no career in drama or acting I didn't and then now, I, why would you think that knowing that television and film uh, existed I as a no, medium? I had no role models from Boston, Massachusetts. You know, everybody's, uh, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, businessman or whatever. I, I just I didn't know anyone who, 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 who ever went into show business. I didn't but know the anything folks about had dragged me. you to theater. They took me to theater, but just that was something other people did. But then I got to UMass and they were doing these plays and they had some facilities and I had no craft. But I just sort of muscled my way into a lot of the leading roles, and I did probably eight or six or eight major, you know, plays during the during the time I was there. Holy crap! You know, like I played Romeo and Romeo and Juliet, and I did the chain, the lead in the Changeling, and I. But it was did still some, just about getting laid. Yeah, I mean that was the. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but this was a nice this was a nice um, this was an it was a nice way to get laid, and meet the girls and I it, yeah it just it resonated for me so by the time I was like approaching senior year I went to one of the drama guys I remember I was so e egotistical I thought hmm maybe I should do something just by myself as sort of a as sort a of one a one man show yeah 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 as sort of a um, Spalding Gray. I didn't know. I didn't even know what a one-man show was. All I, all I, all I. Why are all these other people I, here? What do I need the other people <laughs> for? They're just sort of distractions. So I went to one of the guys in the in the in the drama department, one of the professors, like beginning of my senior year, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about maybe doing a one-man show. What do you think of that idea? He's like, well, what the with the subject? <laughs> and I have no idea what I was talking about. He goes, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, but, uh, and then I went to the same guy a few months later and said, you know, I might like to give this acting shot a, a go. What would I do? Do you just move to New York and then try and get auditions? And he said, well, you can apply to these. You can do that, or you can apply to these different professional training programs. So I applied to all the major ones and decided on going to NYU. And, and NYU was invaluable. The Tisch. Invaluable, School the Tisch. Yeah, in terms of, because I had no idea no. What I was doing. I right. had no craft at all. I thought it was just like get angry, cry. No scene breaking down. No. Do they no. even teach auditioning at, at Tisch? They do, but I left after a year and a half. I left because I wasn't getting any younger. I was probably 24, or 25. My girlfriend at the time got was pregnant with what became, what is now my oldest kid, who's 33, and um, 32, 33, 33. And uh, so I thought, fuck, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. I gotta figure out if this is gonna be a reality or do I have to go to law school or... And so I got out and somebody, had, uh, I, I left and um, somebody at uh, the New York Shakespeare Festival took pity on me and gave me a, 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 a you know, part in the park holding a spear and... Literally moving. carrying a spear? No, uh, it was Moliere, uh, so we didn't have spears, but, uh, you know, <laughs> essentially one of those torch. guys. I was in the ensemble. Yeah, the Asparagus spears. <laughs> yeah. Carrying something <laughs> and moving stuff around. It was Richard Foreman, if you're... Do you have any idea who that is? I did not study the theater, and no, I don't. Okay, I, was, I needn't go into it then. But it was, fa it was fascinating, and then they, they kept throwing me bones over there at the public theater. Right. Keeping me, uh, keeping me employed. And then I, uh, and then... At, not long after that, I got the opportunity to understudy John Malkovich and Gary Sinise in um, Drew West, the sort of revolutionary production that Jesus. brought that brought um, that brought uh, Steppenwolf to New York. Right. And then they left, and then I got to because I had learned all three parts. I had learned. you're understudying that Steppenwolf in New York. They'd done the show. They'd done the play. In Chicago. In Chicago. Right. Then it came to New York. Like, subsequently, all of their shows would. And, um, but this was the first one. This is where everybody became aware of who John Malkovich was. And you're understudying. So you're watching him every night for I'm watching a while? John and Gary every single night. And they basically, pl they played brothers. And yeah. they were basically the same, two versions of the same person. And... Um, so I was watching those two guys. So that became for, you know, four months. That what was like greater training. school is there than none, that? None, none, And um, then when they left, 
there, I was the guy who knew both parts, so they would just uh, they would let me play one of the parts while they brought in some sort of younger, uh, you know, similarly aged movie guy like Danny Stern or Dennis Quaid or Danny, Randy Quaid right. uh, to sell the tickets, and I knew the other part. So whoever the, they bring one guy in to play one part, I just play the other part. So and how long did that go? On? That went well, went on for a year. That's pretty sweet. Maybe two, maybe a year and a half. And this is on the Broadway. This is off the Broadway. Off the Broadway. Off the Broadway. The Cherry Lane Theater is just off sure. Broadway. It turned out that my apartment was two blocks away from the theater, and that Chumley's, the bar that we love to drink in, was right between the two spots. So. So you either slept at Chumley's or your apartment. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Um, when was the hairspray? Many years later? Oh, yeah, yeah. I had come out to, I had come out here. Done all the L.A. stuff. Done, done all the television and theater, and then... Um, so you went back. Years ago, time. yeah, I went back. I saw this play called Urinetown. You ever see Urinetown? Heard about it, didn't see Fantastic. it. Fantastic. It puts, basically, takes the piss out of musicals, right? Musical theater. All the, the name. All the conventions, yeah. As a matter of fact, I took my son, Luke, who was about 17 at the time, and... I said, let's go see your town. He's like, okay, I don't even want to assure it. So we walk in and he looks at his program and he goes, it's called your, you're in town. I thought it was you're in town. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> anyway, so I saw you're in town and I said to my agents, I want to do a musical. I want to do a musical theater. And, um, God love them. They got me that, you know, they got me that gig in, in Hairspray, which was really fun. I just, I had done a play on Broadway that Elaine May wrote a few, a year or two earlier. And I was living in New York at the time, just doing theater, like, because my kids were all gone in college. And um, so I moved to New York and uh, yeah, so. Pretty sweet. Yes, great. There's nothing more fun for me than doing a musical. Jamie, this is your portion of the show. Our guest worked alongside Kenny Rogers, I'm going to say before the eye job. Eye job? Plastic no. surgery. Listen, I think it looks natural. Are you kidding? <laughs> what? His. Oh, 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 oh. And also on with Crime Story with Dennis Farina. Yep. And uh, yes. Huge I, Dennis Farina fans. Yeah, I didn't work with Dennis. Who didn't have any scenes with him? I didn't have any scenes. Any scenes with Kenny Rogers? Ah, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of his chicken, by the way. You can't yeah. get it anymore. The set. What? One, one of the most things. One of the most fun things as an actor to do is be in a musical. For me, sure. musical comedy, so much fun. Also, right up there, playing a cowboy, riding a horse, shooting guns. Have you ever done? Have Ridiculous. Ever? Never have. They. They so rare that they go out to the Jewish <laughs> population <laughs> yeah. for that. Uh. Who do we need for the little Jew? <laughs> yeah. How many Jewish cowboys? Yeah. I don't know. Can you reach the horse? Can you get all, get all? Should we get a ladder? They had like a Wells Fargo bank back didn't in the old West. Harry Ford and Gene Wilder do um, Western together? Yeah. Gene Wilder? Gene Wilder was a, Blazing Saddles. a rabbinical character. I'm telling you, with Harry Ford, otherwise known as Harrison. I learned from The Simpsons that, you know, there were no Jewish cowboys, according to Mr. Bergstrom. Played by Dustin Hoffman. So there you go. Right. Well, well, you got nice, nice reference. <laughs> the Frisco <laughs> Kid, by the way. Frisco Kid was the name of the film. Really? Yes. He was a rabbinical student? Rabbinical something. He might have been a rabbi. Wow. Anyway. Uh, um, that's fun. And, the, and that movie. Yes. Which was silly, but it was actually a miniseries. Yes. I played the bad guy. I still remember Cade Dalton. I was the head bad guy. And uh, th this is the days where if you were on a TV show, you remember these days. If you were on a TV, or maybe you were making prestigious movies at the time I was doing is schlocky this, is television. This around 94, 95? Yeah. I was having a heyday in the motion picture business. God, you did. For the 90s. God, you did. <laughs> what a run. What was that movie you did? You were. This is where I first became aware of your uh, Before we started working genius. together in motion pictures? You did Avalon? Sure. Wow. That was big time. Wow. Yeah. I think it's very good. Beautiful, beautiful. Stunning. Prestigious. Yeah. Alan Davio, oh, cinematographer. So good. He did Empire of the Sun, Color Purple, E.T., yeah. e. brilliant yeah, yeah. cinematographer. Aiden Quinn? Aiden Quinn. I was the only Jew in the cast about Jews. <laughs> right. Aiden Quinn, Elizabeth Perkins. Yeah. 
Armin Müller-Stahl, wonderful German actor. He was the Olivier of Germany. And Joan Plowright. Yeah. Couldn't be more Protestant. I've always said the Jews cannot get a break in Hollywood. <laughs> you were the one who I, said I that. I feel bad for them. Um, <laughs> But no, that was huge. But anyway, so anyway, what I started to say was, it was in the day when- You're riding a you horse. Were, you were on, no, if you were on a TV series- Everyone knew you. You were, yeah, everyone knew you. So the, so the network would just throw you like a mini series or a TV movie or two during your hiatus. Right. It was crazy. It is crazy. It was crazy. For crazy money. Because what also it's the, crazy the, about- the whole, the whole financial paradigm has just changed. Oh to such a degree. Shifted drastically, but what you don't realize, or didn't maybe then, certainly now, is that it behooved them to keep you working. Yeah. In the off season. It just seemed to you like they were throwing you these bones, but in fact, they had, as always, shockingly, had their own best interests in mind. Right, and not, not that I thought, wow, this is amazing at the time. I just thought, oh, like, this is just what happens, and this, this is, is how what it works. I'm doing. It's now, in retrospect, <laughs> That I think about. How did I oh work God. nonstop for oh my 10 God. years? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. How did I work nonstop and do nothing of any value? <laughs> <laughs> I kid. Enter the last five years. I what a kid. run. First of all, before we get to that, one last thing. I know what compromising photos radio legend Mark Thompson has on me, but how do you explain you're also appearing in the only two films he starred in, not to mention finance? 213. The first one. Yeah. How did you know Mark Thompson? I know Mark Thompson because I knew Mark Thompson. He's at the game in North Carolina, by the way, right now. Really? Where? You guys have, made, have, have stayed in contact. We've been friends all these years. Great. I knew Mark because I went in and did his show. Mark and Brian? To promote a series that I was starring in with Mel Harris. Yeah. Something So Right, sure, sure. which was actually a wonderful show. It was a good show. It had a, a, yeah, and it had a nice little run. It had a uh, two-year run. That's two a little run. run. It was a yeah. little run, yeah, and it was nice. Yes. I'm two episodes in, so we'll see <laughs> what a little run feels like. Oh, you know, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. You know that Mel Harris is Byron's mom. Right? Oh, my God. <laughs> One of the jerks that runs this place <laughs> is the son of Byron? Mel. Yeah. Wait, Byron runs this place? He's like second in command, yeah. Mel's son. Byron. What? Yeah. I know Byron. You've known Byron since he was a child. You? Clearly, you know. Yeah. yeah. Has he always been like that? <laughs> <laughs> he can be a little, he's a little abrasive when you first meet him. Is he really? A little bit. Oh, I'm joking. He's I mean, a, he, he, he I think he's an only child. Yeah, um, of those two. When yeah. was the last time you saw or thought of him? I mean, since Byron, he was, his photo's I right there. His what? <laughs> his photo's on the wall. I gotta there. go over there. I, this is my memory of Byron. We were having dinner after the upfronts, me, Mel, and the creators of the show in New York, and Byron was arriving in a cab. Some adult had put him in a cab How old? and was sending him down to the restaurant. And I remember he was young enough that I, Mel said he should be arriving any second, but it was cold outside, so I said, I'll go outside and wait for the cab. So he was young enough so that mm -hmm. I had to go outside and wait for the cab to, mm -hmm. you know, to let, bring him into the restaurant. So seven, eight years old, maybe. Maybe 10-ish, right. alone in a cab in New York, yeah. Well, what year do That's we- That's funny. What year do we think that was? And we'll tell you exactly how old he was. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think it was probably 93, four? What is he, 31? Yeah, he's my age. I think he's my age. Yeah, I think he's like 31 or two. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, give him my best. I'll probably might see remember him tonight. Me. So oh, I'm sure he does. Um, <laughs> yes. I want to jump to... Yes. Uh, I want to jump to win because... It's ridiculous. Oh, but oh, but what about but what about uh, but what about Mark Thompson? Yeah, no, I was just asking you what what compromising photos he must have had on you to get you to be in both of the movies he started. How did he get you? And finance. He's got a photo of me and a sheep. <laughs> no, seriously. No, I, he, he, he just he's nice. He's unabashed. He's unabashed. He will call you, me, Joe Montana. He will call whoever he wants, who he knows has a good heart and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finance another film for me to star in, will you be in it? And there we are. And w has his acting, t w how's his acting career going? He's back on the morning radio. 
Yes. They retire. He's back. And he's back with he's the back show. He's back alone, right? Mark in the morning. Okay. Bigger, in, almost instantly bigger than Mark and Brian were in their latter me. years. Yeah. I only know that because I was in a poker tournament sitting next to Kevin of Kevin and Bean. Yes. A true competitor to Mark right, and Brian. Right, right, right. And I said, yeah, Mark's back on the air. And he said, oh, he's not just back on the air. He's killing it. Whoa. Yeah. Same place, same station? Brand new station, The Sound. Okay, and Re he's killing it. Relaunch, and he's destroying. I was just on last week. I'm going to be at the one-year anniversary, I guess, in February. Give him my best. I will. Oh, my gosh. Sweet guy, and as it turns out, a, a good actor. There's a couple of scenes he was in in the first one we did together. Um, Mother, yeah, that was Mother a, Ghost. Yeah, that was a nice one. Nice, you had a nice, we some nice radio stuff thing. with him. Yeah, 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 yeah. You had nice stuff with him. He had to kind of break down and whatnot. I remember that. Kids full of potential. And then the other one, was that, did, did that ever get released? 213, was that, you was know? Was that releasable? I think it's playing on his house on a continuous loop on a few different screens. Great, good. Depending on which bedroom you're in. Good. Um, as I mentioned, we had Vince Gilligan here. Tell me about your visit to New Mexico. Um, they called uh, and said, it's funny with Breaking Bad because no one really knew. I did the second season and part of the third season, or I did part of the second season, part of the third season. And when the audition came, I think I had just gotten out here, back here from New York. No one had seen the show. Even in its second season, no one was watching Breaking Bad. And so I read the, I read the, the scene. It was the scene uh, around the campfire that introduces my character where I talk about the fact that, you know, he, Jesse says, do you, do, you know, do you know what pain is? And I say, I, I killed my daughter. And then I have that nice, long, incredible speech. It's a great All you had to do was just say the words. And um, so I said, yeah, and I, they, they wanted me to do it. So I did it, and then, um, and then I did the third season. And then Ed Begley called me one day and said, have you seen this show? I don't watch anything that I do. I'm just not a, I don't care. I don't. It's, when it's done, when the rehearsal's over, and it's on, I don't, I don't, I never watch. Uh-huh. He said, have you seen this show, Breaking Bad, that you're in? He said, no. He said, it is fucking great. Yeah. You're not, y even you are not bad in it. <laughs> and I said. That uh, sounds like Ed Beckley Jr. And I Jr. said, uh, really? So I started watching, I got, you know, the first few, I got the first three seasons, and I started watching, and damn, Sure enough, he was right, and it was great. And then everyone started catching on. And then by fifth season, I think the most of the world was on the Breaking Bad. Yeah. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? And um, and now there's no one that hasn't seen it. And when did it, we jump in? Season three. So you probably jumped in around the time that I jumped in. Yeah. 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 And that beak and that re that you know that was created. a relaunch. Yeah. A reboot of yeah. Mary Burns. Yeah, that was the first, yeah, that was me doing, you know, cable tele, cable dramas. Right when cable drama was actually putting a stamp on society because Mad Men and Breaking Bad on AMC, which was only an old movie channel. Revolutionizing content Chance as ever. we know it. But now it's why there are... I was, I was there at the beginning. Yes, you were. I was on, I was there. You were laying brick. I was, <laughs> yeah, mortar. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it is because of this wonderful world of everything's better on cable TV and everyone is rushing to be on a show. Right. That we come to the, uh, the Angie Tribeca. Right. Well, I didn't come to the Angie Tribeca right after that. No, no, there no. There was a lot of mortar to be laid. We're going to go through that because, yeah. again, the win. The win? The win Dixie. The win Duffy. Duffy. <laughs> You were part of the Dixie clan. That's I why I was part of the Dixie head, Mafia. Yeah. Did you do the show? I didn't. I was How just. Did we I was hooked in from day one because Matt Craven is an old friend, and Matt was in the pilot. He sort of played um, Tim's original boss when right. Tim goes from Miami out to yeah. back to yeah. Kentucky. Not they must of. have offered you stuff. They must have come to you. I don't think it ever crossed the path. Really? Yeah. Again, there's a little bit of a Western tone. And the under, <laughs> but still, we I know. Are. I know, um, but I just became an instant fan because of um, Elmore, and also just yeah. I loved Tim from Deadwood, so yeah. I was kind of hooked in right away. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, because um, it was a fun show to be hooked in too. And also, as you've mentioned in other interviews. It was so fortuitous to not be an alpha dog. Yeah. When Duffy. 
so that you could actually survive a season. Because all the alpha villains in that show was beautiful. It was just like Breaking Bad. And I talked to Vince about this because Vince had to, at some point, become aware that the audience was becoming aware that the main villain each season was going to die in the last episode of that season. And then the way he kills Giancarlo Esposito Gus in season four is one of the greatest. Incredible. Ridiculous. And also one of the greatest villains ever. Yeah. But also in a situation where the audience has caught up, we know he's going to die and then kill him in a surprising way that's as surprising as if you didn't know it was a, it was a guarantee. So I'm watching well, Win Duffy and I'm thinking, how is he going to, how is my, my friend uh, going to survive this? Because the character was instantly in everyone's face and such a manipulator that, oh, they got to kill this guy. He can't last. Was there a turning point where you started to feel like, oh, geez, I might be around. They might not kill me. Um, First of all, it was just supposed to be a couple episodes, right? First of all, yeah, I was supposed to get shot in the second episode and killed. <laughs> they and tell you that up front. It's a two show. Well, arc. they show you what you're doing, and yeah, and then and yeah. then you see the second script, and you're like, oh yeah, I get killed. Oh, that's great. Uh, they, they, it was a great death because all the deaths were great. Amazing. So you had a great death. I'm like, oh cool. And more Leonard but, death. Who doesn't want that? Exactly. And then uh, I got to the day we I was supposed to die. I got there, and there was a lot of love on the set. You know, I was feeling um, I was feeling nice there, and. Um, not until the day they were going to shoot your death? Did the stage directions read, Win Duffy is shot through the shoulder, you know, instead of the head, and, um, and as he's wheeled out on the gurney, we see, you know, in the stage directions, that he is very much alive. So that was first season. And Wait a minute. You, you mean when you got the day's sides is when you found out? Yeah. In your got, trailer? Yeah, that yeah. day. They don't tell you. In it. Listen, it might have been the night before. <laughs> it might have been the night before. <laughs> I was just a guest star. Sure. You know what it's like. They I'm have just, other things to I'm worry a guest about. Star. Yeah, they have so many other. They have storylines. You can show them. They just, it was just like, oh, he's good. Everybody like him? Like him. Love him. Keep Tim, him. Tim, are you okay? Yeah. And then there was another day um, in second season where I was supposed to die again, and I, I, Tim saved my character that day. He just didn't like the scene. I loved the scene. It was a Shakespeare. This was even a better death scene, and it was with Tim, just me and him across a table for, you know, 10 minutes, at the end of which I just, you know, <laughs> and um, he didn't want to kill anybody else. Is he that wanna... what turned into the Russian roulette? No, that was two seasons later. Oh, that was two seasons later. He just did, he's, he, I showed up, he, he was like, I remember, it was pouring rain, I got out of my car, I'm like, hey Tim, how's it going? He's like, good, do you like this scene? And I said, uh, yeah, I think it's good, I, I like it, I think I, li I like it. He goes, I don't like it, I don't want to kill you like that. And, um, and you know, he was a, he was a producer, Big he producer was collaborative, yeah. and it was a very collaborative show. And, um, it, you know, everybody was included to a large degree in the collaboration. The more sub substantive stuff you contributed, the more you got listened to. And to Because you didn't learn the early lesson on don't pitch an idea, now it's paying off. I figured off. out how to have better ideas. <laughs> um, anyway, so that death got changed, uh, and, I didn't die and I didn't die then. And then, you know, by third season... They kept trying to do the same thing. They, they wanted to keep doing the same thing. Yeah, we're, we, we want you for about 10 episodes. And by third season, my agent said, well, if you want them for 10 episodes again. Make them a regular, you again. fuck. And they did. Yeah, and they did. And it was great. Yeah. And then I think it was by the end of, by the beginning of the sixth season, I think I, it was pretty clear from the writer, what, the writer, what the writers were saying, that he wins not going to die any time in the first 10. And then, you know, it turned out to be that Wynn didn't die. <laughs> As it turns Wynn out. Wynn didn't die, Wynn got all the money, too. <laughs> As it turns out. And it was great. Yeah. You know the scene. Spoiler in... alerts, but holy crap. The fact that Mary is dying and also Mikey, the character. That was my pitch that I went to them and I said, what about this? Yeah. At the beginning of the sixth season or middle, middle, Middle of the beginning of the sixth season, I went to them and I said, what about this? What about Mikey and I get in a gun battle? Now, and for the folks at home, Mikey, the character Mikey was to... My bodyguard. To win your bodyguard. My bodyguard. A little dim. 
Little Dim. L loyal. Loyal is a loyal is a hound dog. Uh, yeah. And um, I went to them. I said, "What about if Mikey and I get in at some point in the latter part of the season? Mikey and I get in a gun battle, and he gets mortally wounded, and Win has to put him down like a dog. And it's the most compassionate thing Win does in the entire arc of the show. He puts Mikey down like a dog because Mikey's not. And um, and that dog. turned into Mikey lit taking bullets for me. She just. <laughs> emptying a gun and he into dies Mikey. In front of he you. dies in my arms because by then it would have been like yeah. he, he didn't need me to put him down and it was <laughs> nice. We had that nice Mary Steenburgen would put him down pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That that scene in the in the in the Winnebago was was like fantastic. Yeah. And really proud of that. The show was fantastic. It, it, it's pretty good. It maintained a level of uh writing. That's Graham Yost. Man, oh man, he's he's yeah. he's he's the man. He is he's truly. I mean, and, and he, he must have a new show coming out soon because there's no stopping a talent like that, right? Yeah, Graham will do yeah. whatever Graham whatever. will do next. Whatever you know, he wants and it to will do. be good. Yeah, I mean, he also created the Americans, as you know. And I did not know he that he created the Americans. Oh which is well, fantastic. Then that's what he's doing now. Fantastic. No, he's that, someone else has taken that over, um, and um, he's on to to other things. I'm not sure exactly what, but he's on to other things. He and I, um, what was I going to say? And yeah, he, and he has launched a lot of career, a lot of careers for young writers. Do you know what I mean? He oh, brought good. guys in six years ago. Right. Who Vince were, Gilligan loves to do were, that. Yeah. My friend, Sam Catlin. Yeah. was one of the, you know, was one of, became one of the executive preachers. All these young guys that he brought on right. who would write episodes and when it's a great it's a it's a great model if you write an episode for these guys you produce the episode so you may be in you're, you're shooting you're writing in in la but then you go to wherever they shoot the episode and you do all the scouting you find all the locations and when you're sh they're shooting your show you're producing it so you get the you get the experience right. of of producing show running a little taste of show running and all of the guys from all of the guys, like Sam Catlin and yeah. Ben Cavell and a lot of the guys, for, well, Sam's Breaking Bad, but Ben and all these other guys will be showrunners now as yeah. a result of what Graham gave them, what, right. of Graham's model. Yeah. Um, and in the midst of what Burn Notice was... And Vince's model. Burn Notice is towards the end of that or before? Burn Notice was, uh, the shows I think were Breaking Bad, then Justified, during which... There was a little back and forth. I could go, they allowed me, Breaking Bad, uh, Justified allowed me to go do a season of Burn Notice and a good chunk of a season on... Um, Bates? Bates Motel. Um, yeah. I, I never um, tuned in. Which is in a wonderful show. The Base Motel. Yeah, she's amazing. Well, we are going to talk about... Um, she's amazing. A few things uh, in these areas. I, I never did tune in to Burn Notice, but I will say, I, I do want to ask what it's like to step into a show with such rabid fans, because the fans of that show uh, were a little nutty. But also, you have you nutty. seen what your pal from it, Jeffrey Donovan, did in season two of Fargo. No. That's fucking insane. Well, what, what happened? So he's the son I've that takes over the family. I've been wondering, where is Jeff? You've got to see season two of Fargo. Did you see season one? Yeah. Have people annoyed you like me that season two was arguably better? No. Nope. Some, somehow? No. Nope. As I heard season two was, uh, you're not, was you're, disappointing people. That's well, all I heard. You're talking the wrong Not people. the case. Okay. Yeah. That's Ted. I mean, it's a matter and of Jesse tape. Plemons. Jesse Plemons, who you know as. Oh, Meth Damon. Meth Damon. Because yeah. I first recognized and got into him from Breaking Bad. Yeah. So then, to me, he yeah. was always Meth Damon. Yeah. <laughs> and in wasn't a great movie, but in Black Mask, he gained like fifty pounds yeah. to play Stevie Weeks. He's the same in Fargo. Big. So he ends up in Fargo with some some fella tits too. <laughs> Does he? Yeah. Fella tits. That's Left, his character's name. Left over from the Black Mass. Did oh. you enjoy the Black and Mass? And also um, Bridges Spies. Bridges Spies, he had, yeah. He is, yeah. He's also big. Does he have breasts in that as well? Well, when you when any of us get big like that, 
it's yeah. it's a byproduct. Yeah. There's a yeah. scene where he's burning his clothes, so he's in Fargo. Yeah, in Fargo. And you get to so uh, yeah, you, you sent me him. actually a photo of that. He's so <laughs> good. He's so good. Anyway, so Jeffrey Donovan um, is great. You don't have to tell me, but he. He's great. I saw a commercial for Burn Notice. I said, oh, look at this pretty guy. He's a detective or something. And I just, for whatever reason, tuned out as a possibility. So when he showed up in Fargo 2, I thought, who the fuck is this guy? And did and started, you know, went to my phone and there Does he, he was. Does he look completely different? Yeah. Yeah. He's barely recognizable as a formerly ridiculously handsome guy. He's no longer handsome. Well, you can't take away all the handsome, but they certainly did their best. Wow. And he's great. He's phenomenal. Oh, wow. Who? The banana now boat is here. That's <laughs> Harry Belafonte, everyone. That's creative homeless here at the uh, Third Street <laughs> Promenade. We're just off the alley. Which is the home of the home. Where the, a lot of them like to gather and have meetings. And someone is doing a little Well, when you're this close day-o, to the beach. day when you're, when you're three blocks away from the beach. Yeah. It happens. Somebody say Beetlejuice or something? <laughs> uh, um, well, I will, I will. Is he in the whole season? Yep. Okay. I don't want to give anything don't, away. Don't. Um, so I want to know, Walton Goggins. Have you seen the seventy millimeter? Mm-hmm. Okay. So Have you. Yes, he's now a movie star. Mm-hmm. Um, when you were working with him As on he should be. Justified, mm-hmm. were you aware? And I think I wrote this down because I thought it was so clever. Do you believe the theory that ships at sea have actually been signaled? by Walden Goggins' teeth. <laughs> <laughs> they do all they can to dirty them up in The Hateful Eight, because everyone's gritty and grimy. Mm. But do they still but, shine through? But Jesus H.W. Christ, yeah. those are some shiny teeth. Jesus Mary and um, Jesus Joseph and doggy style Mary. I thought Timothy had a beautiful Western gate until Goggins shows up with his Western gate. And then it's a gate off. Who has the yeah. more Western with the yeah. tiny hips yeah. and the little gate that comes through the, yeah. the, the swinging door. It yeah. really is yeah. spectacular and from another time. Yes. Do you think they each worked on it or it's in their natural gate? I think it was just part of who they became. Yeah. yeah. Spectacular. Yeah. How is he as a fella? Because he goes from the, the swastika baron tattoo fella Walton, how was his character? He was he fun to play with on the show? Yeah, he was great. He was great to play with. He's more of the guy that has to um, go outside and be by himself and smoke cigarettes, and then come in. And I'm, um, I'm pretty much go make myself a PB and J, and then come in and do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to. I don't do that. I don't work that. I don't. Yeah. Most of the time. You left the torture behind. Yeah. I mean, I got the torture anyway. It's just genetically imprinted in me. So it doesn't take much to access it. I don't have to be outside screaming, fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Try acting, dear boy? Yeah, exactly. Um, But he's amazing and very generous and very collaborative. Yeah. No, it's fun. Sweetheart. It's fun to mention these uh, uh, rituals. Yeah. um, And have a little fun with mentioning them. But I agree with following it with, was he a white hat or a black hat in real life? Because we've already had a little front with with, with James Spotter. So it's important. Who I never had, who I never exchanged a pleasantry with. You know, I never had a word. I never had the opportunity to know him. Very standoff. I don't know. Maybe he's a, maybe he's a lovely guy. (laughs) Goggins, on the other hand. Lovely guy. One of the great names. Walton Goggins. So he just stepped out of a Western into acting with that name. Yeah. Right? Yes. Well, his, his real name is Murray Pendleton. <laughs> <laughs> he changed it. That to is Walt- fantastic. He changed it to Walton Goggins about... Did you say Murray? Murray P- Pendleton no. is what he was born Not Murray. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I came up with that. That's fantastic. It just come, it's a gift. I don't know. It just came. You There's no off switch. You can't teach it. Nope. No. You can't even study it. Mm-mm. You learn that on its feet. Mm-hmm. 
Um, where did he come from? Do, do, do we know? I mean, I, I can look know. it up. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, he's made me curious I, now. I think he's one of these guys that came... Up the hard way. and I don't know if he came up the hard way. I just know that I, I read people's bios and they got to L.A. when they were like 16 okay. or 17. And or he, they lived in L.A. and they started acting when they were 12. Right. Like not my experience. Do you know what I mean? I like, got the feeling he's one of those guys that was a, he sold vacuums in LA when he got to LA and then he drove a, a, a limo for a little while. I don't know. And then he, yeah. I don't know. The thing I do remember is that he got here early, mm. early and young. Right. Which is also a law firm here in town. Early, early and young, young and young, early, early, young and young. Um, Jamie, we're back to you before we get to um, multi-episode arcs with the formidable Vera Farmiga. We're going to go to back to Jamie because you got a chance to do a little mugging with the Muppets. I did. This is the new show. The new show, yeah. You Please tell more. Um, well, my friend Bill Prady called and asked if I would do him a favor. They were doing a presentation for the network. It wasn't really a presentation. No, it was a presentation. So they had to shoot... 10, 15, 12, 10 or 15 minutes with the Muppets, show it to the network to get the network to approve it. He had tried to sell it to ABC a bunch of times. They didn't apparently want it. And then um, he pitched it to Netflix. Netflix said, where do we sign? And then ABC, I guess, heard about Netflix saying, where do we sign? They said, oh, no, no, we love that idea. So ABC, I guess, you know, outbid them and now they're, they were on ABC. So he asked me to come do a, uh, a presentation so it only take you one. It only take one day. All I need is you for you know twelve hours on a Sunday. And I thought Bill's a nice guy. I'll do him a favor. It'll be a pain in the neck, but I'll do him a favor. And it was just enchanting yeah. to work with those guys. Well, tell me how and why. Just enchanting because they're so, they're puppeteers of like the highest order. It's ridiculous, right? And they've been around. Some of those guys have been around since Jim Henson, or were interns during Jim Henson, and. It's just kind of marvelous. You forget completely that you're working with a puppet, a giant puppet, and it becomes and the, an actor. And they add lib in character, you know, between takes. And you get to the set, and all the sets are are built with trenches. No, not with trenches. All the sets are elevated. So the, the guys, the puppeteers, the, the stage that you're standing on will be up here. And the whole set will be up here. And these guys will be down below the stage, which is a grid, operating Fosse or whatever the character is, and looking at a screen and w looking at a video monitor of exactly what the people in the scene are doing in the moment. So they're reacting in time as the puppet watching a quad. So I think they have like a master and then a close-up of every person in the scene. So they're responding to the image they're seeing. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. So it's completely real. It's completely spontaneous. It's completely complicated. Right. And it's uh, And they're all super pros. Right. And the guy that directs it is amazing. I can't remember his name, but it was amazing. It was just, it was really, really cool. Now, Jamie, did you know that to that degree that, that that's how these the shows were being made? Because I find this kind of fascinating because we are just presented with this beautiful world. I feel like we learned this whenever. Remember we saw... Um, uh, uh, it was off Broadway. We, we took Craig Bierko and his girlfriend, I think now wife at the time. That's not part of the story. Avenue, anyway, I just try to remind you. But it was the, they had, it was people that worked for uh, the Jim Henson like Muppet Workshop, but they were doing improvised comedy with, the, with Muppets. Do you remember that? Yes. And they were explaining that. They were, they did like a, they were like, this is what it looks like to you on TV, but this is what you're, we're actually doing. YouTube. Way cool, yes. I didn't remember the quad split TV screen though, the monitor that you're I, you describing. You know what, I never it. really looked at the monitor. But they're so looking at some that sort of quad. monitor. They're, to, they're looking at yeah. a video image of, of every person in the scene. Whether they have a master and four close-ups, I don't know. But right. They, they're look, they see exactly what you're doing in the moment. We have a question from you live from the Twitterverse. Mm. When can we hope to see you in a role that is less tweaked, more comedic? You have great timing. 
What a great segue, what a segue for way. us. What is that? The producers of my show? <laughs> well, at Lizzie K. Gaz. Does that sound like one of the producers of the show? Nope. Thank you, Lizzie K. Gaz. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, tonight... Funny you should ask. If you're watching live, tonight begins a 25-hour? 25-hour. 25-hour binge opportunity. Binge-a-thon, as they're calling it. Which you and your uh, co-stars will last for how long during the commercial breaks? The first couple hours? Uh, probably about five hours, six hours, and it will go on for 25 hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the first... Season of Angie Tribeca right. on TBS. And they're playing it commercial free. We are playing it, they are playing it commercial free for 25 hours. Between the episodes, we'll be there in live. A, in a studio kind in of thing. In a studio, answering phone calls. Like a telephone. Doing little, yeah. Doing little funny th stuff, interacting with each other and inter doing, entertaining whatever comes along. You know, right. if we order pizza and we like the pizza guy, he'll be part of the whole all the interstitial stuff. But it will be commercial free. You get to see the whole season. And I think, do the math, but they're 22 minutes long and we'll be on for 25 hours. So that well, I think the whole, the, the first season will air for probably six times, seven times, whatever, the, six times, five, six times. Right. It's a half hour show? Half hour show, so it's really 22 minutes of content. And when it will have its weekly run. And then we will go on next week um, and the subsequent 10 weeks at 9.30 on Monday nights. TBS has, Kevin Riley has taken over TBS, completely rebranded the network. Everything that was on the network is gone and he's introducing a whole new style, look and feel of programming and it's really funny stuff. Yeah. It's really funny stuff. I did a I'm little- I'm real proud of our show. You were on our show. I did a little gag on the show. I, well, there's no way we're going to even hit, hint at what it was, but no. I will say I've waited 20 years, 22 years, maybe 23 years for the opportunity for this kind of cameo, specifically. Mm-hmm. And it was a blast, and mm -hmm. everyone was great. Mm -hmm. um, Rashida, your co-star, Jones, has threatened to be on this very show. Maybe today you'll mention to her, hey, now's the time. Okay. Um, <laughs> she should do it. Well, especially while the show is in its uh, initial launch, because yeah. I think one of her things was when we, sometimes we, I'll talk to people and they'll say, love to come on when I have something I want to push, even though I try to say, eh, it's not really this type of show. but. The last Sunday in January, actually, might be perfect for her if the timing works out. Yeah, this is perfect um, for today. I'm excited for her. And also, Steve Carell and his lovely wife, Nancy, Nancy created it. Created the damn show. Yeah. And as a result of having Rashida and the Carells and some amazingly funny scripts, we've gotten people like you. Well, but uh, John Hamm, and let's John go down Hamm, the list. John Hamm, Bill Murray. Bill Murray. Bill Murray did, did an, an episode. episode. Just showed up. Now, Corral's got juice, ladies and Jews, but Murray's got an 800 number. Yep. Well, There's no way to get to him. Rashida was just in the Murray Christmas special. Yes. Except for they're the fact, they're I think, that they're pals. I assume. Yeah. Um, so Murray else? showed We've had Keegan Michael Key, we've had Gary Cole, we've had um, uh, Heather Graham. If we've you wouldn't had, mind, uh, let's spend a little time <laughs> talking about the Bill Murray episode. So he shows up. Yes. Being the ghost that he is. Yes. Hero to I all. I prefer to call him Sasquatch. Sasquatch. There's a Bigfoot <laughs> element. More people claim to have seen him than have. Mm -hmm. He shows up, hero to all with co comedic juice running through their veins. And Lucy Goosey, open, free, and fun. Collaborative. Collaborative. Serious. Very serious about what's funny. Not very serious, but serious about the work. Yeah. Yeah. We're here. Has ideas. Um, uh, what if? Do, I mean, it's not like, oh, I'm doing these guys a favor. I'll come in and, uh, you know, and do what I do. Very serious about, like, how do we make it better? What could I do? Would this serve? What if this? Like a pro. What if that? Yeah. Like a real fucking pro. Like a pro. real fucking pro. Right. Yeah. Um, personable. Loves the crew. Personable. Oh man, she's a guy from Chicago. Right. 
Yeah. When, it, when it, it's all said and done. Yeah. He's a funny guy from Chicago. Yeah. His older brother. He's intimidating, though. Very. You know, I find him intimidating because, not because of anything he does, just because of what, the way I feel about him. Right. right? You know what I mean. That you is, that? That is that? it exactly, and I hadn't heard it articulated so perfectly. Do you feel that way? It's not it's because okay. of the legend lore that floats with him like so much dust and dirt with pig pen from Peanuts. It's because of how I feel about him. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've become quite close with his older brother, Brian Doyle, because he lives a block away, and we've foisted ourselves onto his petard and, um, and uh, love him to death. Um, and and w at Brian's 70th, Bill appeared literally as a ghost <laughs> at, the ga at the gathering. He came in a costume. Well, well it was Brian's Halloween birthday night. is October 31st. And Halloween night. And it was a surprise party, and we were all supposed to show up in costume and pretend that we were, we were trick-or-treaters. And Bill, of course, came later than we were all supposed to. And, but he came like as a sheet, like he just like, he made- A ghost. He, yeah, he made a, uh, he took a hotel sheet and made a ghost costume. Which, as he explained later, came from the hotel he was staying at. Yes, and there was a whole, of course, there's a whole story behind it. When he too. asked downstairs, do you have any old sheets? Well, because he said, he said, well, I tried to use the sheet on the bed, and it was like, you know, the thread count was really high, so it was too heavy, and I didn't want to be hot, so then I called up the bellhop, and, you know, or housekeeping, oh, and had them bring funny. me one and a pair of scissors. He's like, apparently I wasn't the first person to ask that that night. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I wasn't the yeah, first person to ask. Yeah, he said. I mean, I don't know. There was a backstory that came with the sheet, mm -hmm. but the point is the only conversation I ever had with Bill Murray, and I'll take it. Yeah, we yeah. were the, we were the same <laughs> way. I had met him passing at some SNL thing twenty five years ago at some gathering of people. Yeah, and it was just hi, nice to meet you. This was in a room with just friends of Brian and and all six brothers were there. There were six Murray really? brothers. So Joel, we've had on the show, and we know a little bit. John, who actually does the best Brian Doyle. Um, but How old is John? Is he in show business? I don't not, know. Not acting anymore. I know, he, he was, mm -hmm. and then I don't know. Okay. So, but the thing about- I don't about, know our ages, but I know them in order. I can tell you the brothers in Brian, order. Brian, Bill. Well, there's, Aunt, uh, there's um, Ed. Ed. Ed's the eldest, then Brian, then Bill, then Andy, John, and Joel. Okay. Yeah. And there's three sisters. So all six brothers Jesus. were there. Yeah, there's nine. <laughs> wow, okay. Uh, the sisters were not there. No. Yeah, they refused. I don't wouldn't understand the blackout on the, on the birthday thing. But yes, uh, him in a room is, it's because of how I feel about him. You're right. That's why I'm acting like a weirdo. Yeah. He's fine. Yeah. He couldn't be more comfortable with everything. Yeah. I mean, I instantly started falling over myself about how we had just seen the Barry Levinson movie yeah, good job. Yeah, like an idiot. Oh, you know, we have Barry Levinson in common, I said, thinking that would be an icebreaker, well, the when no icebreaker was needed. Also, while well, the movie's bombing. And the movie had just opened, and it was tanking. <laughs> so, what good was job. Movie? Rock well, the Casbah. Rock the Casbah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't, like, an, it wasn't like a fuzzy thing to bring up, really. Well, no, luckily, I, I saved us with it, because I overheard him talking about the bed she the, the sheet. And I was like, so, so I got him to, I pulled that story out of him. You're lucky you have me. Who else in our lifetime? Yeah, you're not wrong in so many ways. <laughs> Kenny, feel free to chime in. Who else in our lifetime carries around this ridiculous thing where people fall over themselves because of, as you said, I don't know. Finally, correctly, of how we feel about him. Yeah. Um, so he shows up and he's a pro. And so this show ends up being, I'm guessing, to answer at Lizzie K. Gaz. A request, an opportunity for you to come back to the fold. You know, the TV launch of Jerry Burns was on a, a wonderful uh, sitcom, Dear John, yep. where you not only be as a series regular for the first time of yep. successful show, but a standout character on the show, and Thank you. dare I say, became a television star because of it. Okay. The show was a hit. Yep. And Judd Hirsch, uh, first coming back to TV after Taxi. I'm feeling. Yeah. 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 So there was a lot of attention on the show. What is Judd Hirsch doing now? And so where, and so then you uh, sort of launched this dramatic career and now coming back to comedy. And you've said in a couple of interviews that J Mac, our very own research producer, producer sent me, you know what I'd like to do is get back to comedy a little bit. I've missed it. Yeah. I'm loving to hell the drama I'm being allowed to do. Yeah. 
And now here you are. And so the show is played straight while having a, a tongue fir firmly planted, but also there's a little bit of airplane uh, sense of humor. There's a little bit of, how would you explain? Well, it's basically a parody of a procedural. Without being aware of itself. Hopefully. I think, I think the less we're aware of the joke, the better. And I think we found, John, at the first season, don't get me wrong, is hilarious. We tweaked it a little in the second season. So I think it's even more straight, even darker, even more deadpan. And that just feels better to me. Play it real. As real as you can. Which, by the way, is the only way I want to play comedy anyways. Right. And when you get in that multiple camera in front of an audience, you tend to play right. the nonsense. Right. Which is a shame, because that's not really where the comedy... Right. And it's not for camera, so you don't have the the temptation to let, you know, to tell the joke to that guy in the corner. But in the also back wait row. for the audience uh, to stop laughing. Right. You come from live theater, you enjoy the four camera. I love it. But, but this can be tiny and small and yeah, dark and tiny. Tiny and small. And there's so many side gags and there's so many just silly, stupid, stupid stuff that it transcends stupidity into, I think, cleverness, smartness. Yeah. I mean, as the, and the reviews have, Just the, must critical, have been. The, the critical reviews have been insane. Like, I mean, even the New York Times, where a half hour television comedy said, there are probably some problems, but I can't remember what they are. <laughs> you know, so sure, even there's when, some clunkers, but. Even know, when they love a show, the New York Times has to point out, there probably are problems here. But it's so but good. I, I can't don't, remember what they were. I don't remember because I was too busy laughing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and what, what from this format gets critically received well? Well, I will say you're in the right place because cable comedy now has an opportunity to shine and be great in the reviewer's eyes, whose job it is to critique. Like yeah. they hated the sitcom I'm on because it's on CBS. I hated some like uh -huh. mixed. Uh -huh. But the best you could hope for in a network half hour comedy is mixed. Is mixed. Yeah. Like, Cable, they can't wait to, I think, root for, please give us something fresh. Please. Because mm -hmm. that's only happening in Cable, mm -hmm. in their eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so the Corrells uh, create the show, they, they get the show, and then you get to play the sergeant. The lieutenant. The lieutenant. But the guy who runs... The screaming, frustrated guy who calls everyone into his office and lays out what what the caper is. And you know from the first script you read, oh boy, this is going to be... It's going to be fun. Yeah. The Corrells, the pilot was hilarious. And I'm barely in the pilot. My character is barely in the pilot, but the pilot was hilarious. And the people they got to come and do it, Lisa Kudrow, Gary Cole. They called in some favorites for that first everybody. episode? They called in everybody, and everybody reads it and wants to come in and do whatever they can. And Rashida's just a phenom. Lovely. Yeah, she's ridiculous. Lovely. Just lovely. Yeah. She's got something. She's just a star. You yeah. know what I mean? She's a good actress. Very good actress. But she's just got something and that you love, and that you absolutely love. Camera absolutely loves her face right loves her eyes and She's then parks, got and, it. parks and rec taught her the the nuances of comedy apparently sure. something somebody did i think she's been doing this for you know since she was in her early 20s so yeah and she's so smart real smart smart girl you just finished we are all we have three episodes left of the second season right so the network picked up the show before we aired for a second season. We're almost done with that. Always a good sign. Good sign. I find. Good sign. Before you go Never on Never happened air. to me before. <laughs> and um, so yeah, so it, 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 the binge is tonight. They can watch it subsequently at 9.30 on Monday nights uh, on TBS. Starting next Monday? Starting next Monday. And, um, and it'll be available on a number of, I guess it'll be available you know, it's so different the way you can find the content now. Thank goodness, by the way. TBS.com, yeah. I guess. Comcast, for those who have it within the first three days. Yeah. As opposed to waiting it, for two weeks to it's view crazy. it. It's crazy. We had eight million viewers in the first episode, but then after the bonus add-ons. You mean the people that T-vote it? 
Uh, and also video on demand and everything, CBS.com, everywhere else you can go to watch it. Like what you're does saying, it go to? It went to 10 million plus. Two million more. Right. 25% increase. That's crazy. Right. But that's the world right. as we right. know it. And what percentage of the people, where, where does that? What do you watch live other than sports? News. We, we grew up in a News. time when you knew the time slot and you tuned in because that's the only time you had a chance to see it and it yeah, meant the, something. There were only three channels. You knew what was on every channel. But specifically, they even in Thursday night NBC invented a name for it. Must see TV. Dear John was part of it. Yes. It was like some show. I can't remember what it was, but it was some show from 8.30 to 9, Cheers at 9, Us at 9.30, and L.A. Law. Yes. And there was a show at the beginning of the two hours, I can't remember the name of it, and that was, uh, it might have been the show with John Larroquette. What was that show? Night Court. Night Court. Might have been Night Court. Probably was. And that was called Must See TV. I think we used to get, thir you know, I, the it number was, was probably astonishing. Was, I watched all those shows. 30 million, Night probably. Court religiously, and Night Court still holds up, and I don't want anyone arguing me, it still holds does up. Does it still hold up? I'll bet Absolutely. Dear John does. Why aren't they showing that fucking show? I'm sure they are somewhere. It got a very small syndication syndication package. I don't. I, they are showing it. I'm sure. Somewhere. I just don't know where. But it's not. It's, where do you find Night Court? It's on one a movie channel like Encore or something. They show like Murphy Brown Night Court and like a couple other wow. random sitcoms. There was and another. And it's nice because they show them well, not uncut, but without commercial breaks. Right. So they'll just show like. There know, was another term, something programming. If like you wait, I always hated NBC. I think also coined the ter uh, the phrase like, "If you haven't seen it, it's new to you." I hated that. There you go. That was another one. Like if it would, they were in reruns, right, they would go, right, "Wow, right, if you right, haven't right, seen right. it, it's new to you." Right. I want to say appointment <laughs> programming. There was another term where people made a point to watch this well, show. I think appointment programming is really just anything before DVR when it airs live. So now, since there's no reason to watch it live, because We've all got TVs that can let us watch it later. And so many people don't have cable. A lot of, uh, especially the young people. Well, that's why when a show gets 8 million viewers or a 2 rating in the 18 to 49, they stay on the air. Right. When the 2 used to, you had to have a 14. Right. Um, because the networks and the advertisers are also aware that, that uh, there's just too many opportunities to watch it whenever the fuck you want. But do you hear that? Do you hear from people? I don't have cable. Yes. Well, because if it's a $139 cable bill versus 300 I mean, uh, $300. $300 cable bill versus the, the other $39 thing. internet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're 27. <laughs> you're right? 27. Right. No, but we have friends our, our age that just say, I, I can't be bothered. Yeah, with this now. But I, I, my thing is, is I'm still from the old school of I just like physically like going through. Well, now it's not like really channel surfing, but going through the guide. Yes. Like I, I don't know. I like that. I, I don't. I like that uh, task. Or I guess it's not really. But I don't. Know. I will watch something that's on even if I have a DVD and I haven't watched it in years. I do that. There's watch something it. about it being yeah, yeah, on yeah, 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 that yeah, makes yeah. you part of. An experience that happened to me last night kept me up to 1 30 in the morning <laughs> was it clue? trying to remember what the hell it got. was it clue no no clue went away as soon as you started to go to sleep <laughs> <laughs> clue's a good movie i was enjoying it a classic but not say. that much um no it's very nice it's very funny for a while <laughs> um what the fuck hooked me in last night i don't know we got to get you out of here <laughs> um you're going to do this live event i'm very excited for you and for the fans that are soon going to be yelling and screaming about An Angie Tribeca. Angie Tribeca, TBS, part of the new hip comedy programming. Courtesy of Kevin Riley. Courtesy who ran Fox, and then he ran, and then he, now he's running this. Yeah. Um, fairly painless, right, for 90-plus minutes? What? This. This? Yeah. This is so fun. Okay. Has it been 90? It goes fast. Right? It That's why fast. when you asked in the beginning, how long are we going to... I know, it goes fast. I wasn't asking, like, how long are we going to... I was asking, like, <laughs> I, gotta get I wish I didn't have to go <laughs> yeah. to this other thing. We have... Um, let me see, make sure all these... Uh, did you try on many caps and gowns as a child? Actually, what is your fave venue, Broadway, TV, or film? That comes um, from at Hot Potato 01. 
I love doing uh, theater. It's probably my first love, but I, I, I love everything equally. I would, I would have a hard time not, not doing a play every few years, though. We have a fun game on the show called um, a T5. No reason to run the graphic. It's called a Tweet 5. This one comes from Facebook, though. It's five questions designed rapid fire, specifically for you. Coke or Pepsi, no correct answer. Here we go. Homer's Donuts or Homer's Odyssey? Uh, donuts. Roger Ebert or Jay Sherman? Roger Ebert. Fox suits or Disney suits? Fox. This is for Al Jean. Yeah. Why yeah. the fuck is this here? But we're getting legitimate answers from our Keep guests. Going. Roll through it. <laughs> <laughs> we're almost done. <laughs> I won't finish. <laughs> These are not good questions. No, they're not designed <laughs> for you at all. Yeah, they're not. These are not good. What are you doing? I rolled through my questions and for some reason it, it had last week's or last show. Um, all right, so the last thing you have to do for us is something all the guests except for Jane Campion, that wonderful filmmaker who was not funny at all, but at one point during the interview said... You had Jane Campion. Well, I love to laugh. And we all never stop laughing. That's just said that. <laughs> yes, tune into that. The, what did you talk to her The about? weekend the Bright Star opened, we had Jane Campion, her last film. Yeah. Which How long did she last on the podcast? How many, was Over that an hour. That was back, I think, when we had two guests at a, um, oh, at a time. Oh, because it was actually Robin got both of those guests, and it was um, them and the Once people who I don't know their names. People from the uh, film Once, Glenn Hansgard. Can I just say, <laughs> you two yeah. are like a perfect combination for each other. Because? Because you are just, it's so symbiotic. You know how with some couples... You can tell, yeah, uh, I, I, I see why they like each other, but it's tense to kind of be around them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, but Corey's it's not witnessed fun some of that. To be, but you just get like, oh, I, just, oh, I can't imagine what it's like when they're. But you know, I, it's very, it's just very nice. So I wish you well. Oh, buddy. Seriously. You're welcome back. Seriously. Well, I went there this morning what? whenever he pissed me off and I yelled at him really badly. So there you but go. I don't even, that doesn't even sound like it would be, um, I, I mean, unpleasant. But that's no. a, or toxic in any way. I don't sense any toxicity. I'm still waiting for an apology, by the way. Yeah. Which will uh, never come. <laughs> but see, just the way you said that. Yeah. Did he nice. eat your uh, chicken piccata? The fact that the apology <laughs> will never the come cat? and she's okay with that. No. <laughs> that is the secret to a good relationship well, right if there. if she were truly oh. okay with it, would she have not have mentioned it? Oh, no, Jer Jared. It's going to my resentment. <laughs> yeah. going You'll write it. You'll do it. Yeah. yeah it's, going <laughs> it's going on your fourth. Okay. It's, going on. it's on my permanent yeah. record. I was going to apologize in the car and she somehow changed the subject and I thought, oh, I should probably <laughs> I not bring it up again. I dodged a bullet. Um, the last thing we need you to do is a game that Jamie, as our head writer, created long ago called the Larry King Game. It's fairly painless. You're looking at that camera when you play the game. Larry, we hardly knew you, but he would look in the camera right before he would go to the phones and he would share something about himself or his thoughts on nothing in particular. And we loved that moment of Larry King's show when he was on CNN. Mm. I love Oreo cookies and here's why. And no one gave a shit. Okay. So I want a bad Larry King impression. I don't want a good one, so the pressure's off. You don't have to do a good one. Don't even remember how he sounded. Okay. I want a bad Larry King impression because that makes me laugh the most. And then share something about Larry, as Larry, into that camera right before you go to the phone. And when you go to the phones, a funny sounding city maybe from somewhere near where you grew up might Wait be good. Wait a minute, this is a lot of fucking... <laughs> yes, I don't even know what you're fucking asking me to do. So here it is, here it is again. It's been so nice up until now. Bad Larry King impression, share something from Larry's point of view about anything, Okay. and then go to the phones. That's it, when you're ready. There's your camera. Then we'll get you in your car. <laughs> Gun control. Thoughts. <laughs> Let's go to the phones. Pick a city. Boston, you're on the air. <laughs> and out. That's, ladies and Jews, how you literally phone it in. Wait, don't get up, you're wired. Oh. All right, stay tuned. Uh, sit there uncomfortably while I wrap things up for the folks at home, actually, it would be even better. All right. Ladies and Jews, thank you so much. Our guest next week is up to Sam Levine as he returns as the guest host. I have to go do a uh, poker tournament for Ben Hoofleck. Who came up with that name? Who? Uh, Chris Kattan. Chris Kattan. It was from a mango sketch. Yeah. Uh, for the Congo, Water in the Congo, I believe, is the charity. 
We'll tell you more about that. Sam Levine, follow him on Twitter, at Sam Levine. He'll tell you who his guest is. We'll come back the following week, uh, J- January 31st, with hopefully... I'll be back. Rashida Jones, <laughs> as, as held by Jerry Burns. Thank you so much, by the of way. Of course, thank you. Truly. It was really fun. Uh, follow really us fun. on the Twitter, um, and let us know your thoughts. Write to us, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Uh, and thanks for joining us here in this new year, 2016. That is it, and as always, get out of my face. Oh no, I want to thank everyone, don't go away. Did you go, did you go away? No. Okay. Uh, joining us newly on the crew, J-Mac, his name of course? Oh, Ryan Noble. Noble? Yeah. Right. We'll work on that name. Ryan, thanks for helping out. First time here, Ryan Noble helping out. Samantha Ward on makeup, evil Dr. Kenny Chen with gifts. From, as it says here, Hong Kong Disneyland. I got a nautical deal. You got a nautical deal. That cup's been on the table the whole time. Corey Levin sitting in for Sam Levine. Thank you. (laughs) Jamie, I apologize severely and sincerely for this this morning's debacle. It doesn't count until we get in the car and I say it more sincerely. Um, (laughs) J-Mac, Sean Casey, everyone here at Westside Comedy Theater. Now I've thanked everyone. Natalie Rosen somewhere missing in time. (laughs) Until next time, man, as always, get out of my face.